Good afternoon. Um, I wanted to welcome everyone to the BMRU Industry Symposia, Biomarker Enhanced Clinical Assessment of Sepsis and AKI. We're so pleased that you've elected to join us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Les Garlinghouse. I'm the Associate Director for Renal Biomarker Immunoassays at BMRU. Um, and I will be moderating uh, this session. So once we get started, please feel free to type in your questions. Um, we will address all the questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Um, so feel free to, to type in your questions as, 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 as they, they come to mind. Um, let me take a few moments to introduce our presenter. Um, so uh, Dr. Lou Guzzi is the Director of Critical Care Medicine at Advent Health Waterman in Tavares, Florida. Um, he is quadruple board certified in critical care medicine, anesthesiology, internal medicine, and neocritical care. He cares for patients at Florida Hospital in Orlando and has more than 20 years of experience to his name. Dr. Guzzi is a graduate of Georgetown University School of Med Medicine in Washington, D.C., and he carried out his residency training program at the Dwight D. Eisenhower Army Medical Center and Walter Reed Army Medical Center. He remained at Walter Reed for his advanced fellowship training in critical care medicine. He actively participates in both anesthesiology and critical me medicine, and he lectures both nationally and internationally on both topics. So without further ado, let me go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Guzzi, and we'll get started. Thank you. Well, thank, uh, thank you, Les, for that very kind introduction, and uh, thank you, everybody, for giving us a little bit of your time here to talk about biomarkers. You know, I always find it fascinating that uh, I always like to share that I remember the first time I heard of a biomarker. It was, I think, 1992, um, no, 1990. I was at uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. I was working at a hospital in uh, Nashville, Moonlighting, and there was this uh, funny new test coming out called troponin, and it was a biomarker. And I remember a very famous cardiologist. In fact, I remember reading his textbook saying we would never need these markers, that these things would never be valuable because we always knew when somebody was having a heart attack. It's funny, I was doing critical care this week. We had something like 10 STEMIs and all those STEMIs had EKG changes, troponins and troponin tracking. So biomarkers are here, they're here to stay. I don't think we're gonna be talking about our first or last biomarker. It's always exciting when we add a new one to our armamentarium and I always think of it this way, just putting another tool in our toolbox is very, very important. And uh, I think in terms of AKI, as we all think about biomarkers, nothing tells us quicker what we have going on. So thank you guys for joining us. Thank you to BioMariU for the opportunity. And thank you to my society, the Society of Critical Care Menu, or Medicine, for giving us a venue. My disclosure is obviously I'm speaking for BioMariU. I've done a lot of research in the past looking at, uh, at different agents for Pressos for La Jolla and have been heavily engaged for almost the past 15 years in non-invasive uh, development of uh, tools uh, for Edwards Life Sciences, actually longer than that, way back to my early military career. Let's talk about AKI. What do we know about AKI? Well, first of all, it's very common, and it's an incredibly costly burden. I, um, I'm working on writing a paper with some uh, fellows from around the country talking about AKI, and one of the things that absolutely staggers me is the cost to the health system estimated anywhere between 5.4, and I would argue the 20 billion might be closer. But what I also know, and, and I, I work in a hospital that's near one of the oldest communities in the country, the villages, I also know the toll on the people, the people who get it, uh, that uh, husband and wife, one of them has AKI. The physical toll on them is absolutely staggering. We know that it occurs in 57% of patients on day one of their ICU stay. I always remind myself, nobody ever comes to the hospital saying, hey, let me come to the ICU. We know that 42% of critically ill patients with sepsis develop AKI, probably one of the most common things we've seen. Again, one of the reasons why our uh, saving or surviving sepsis campaign exists. We know that the mortality rate for AKI is stunning, and it's not just from the AKI. We can always dialyze you. It's from the other comorbid conditions that are created, part of or part and parcel of the AKI is about 25%. We know that 24% of AKI patients receive some sort of renal replacement therapy, representing a significant healthcare burden. Nothing has taught us more than in these COVID days when we've had you know, staff doing their you know, second and third shift in, in two days trying to keep our CRRT 
our HT going and the burnout rate. And, you know, when I talk to my nephrologist, just the struggle to find staff these days, as we all have seen a burnout. So it's expensive. It's costly. We often think of hospital costs as costly. I think of the cost of getting that patient home and what's going to happen to their family. We know that what we have for diagnosis or diagnostic tools are inadequate for assessing risk of AKI. Every intensivist I know will say, well, I know that they're in trouble. I just don't know how much trouble they're in. And I think to myself, that is a very true statement. <clears throat> just this past week, post-op emergency heart, you know, was doing okay, then started dropping off, sending off a uh, network check, and all of a sudden we see that he's got early AKI and we could act very quickly. So it is in our armamentarium. It's something we think about. I know that we often follow the viewing keratinin and we think we are, you know, have a, a clear cut uh, look at when somebody's going into renal failure. But I think you're going to be stunned when you see that we know its incidence is very high. It is increasingly common and it's devastating, again, financially, emotionally, just even getting people moved around who need uh, dialysis. Just us trying to get somebody actually to take the patient who's on dialysis in a, a skilled nursing facility. It affects anywhere from 7% to 18% of all hospitalized patients. We know that up to 50% of critically ill patients will develop some form of AKI. And it's actually among the top problems in terms of potential inpatient complications. It's first in terms of total length of stay. We actually did a little look-see at our hospital. It increases length of stay by about 12 days minimum. So that means that that's your median. It's second in terms of increasing hospital costs. All those folks who show up to do dialysis are not cheap. And it's 18th in terms of increased risk of mortality. That's why we don't think of it as severely as we do. Because even though its cost is high, its length of stay is high, its devastating effect on the uh, family is high. In terms of mortality, our machines can keep our AK patients, AKI patients alive. I would argue that if we could potentially do a better job, we would have actually fewer patients with AKI long-term. Again, what do we know about AKI? Acute kidney injury is a rapid, typically within 48 hours, loss of kidney function. It is included, but not limited to, to acute renal failure or to acute kidney injury. Only 6% of acute kidney injuries cases advance on and require renal replacement therapy. We know that the KDGO guideline or the KDGO criteria was building on previous guidelines and gives us a standardized definition of what actually is AKI. And that staging criteria, along with the rifle risk factors, are what tell us what we can base that on based on increases in serum creatinine and decreased urine output and give us a severity level. The criteria are good for epidemiologic studies, but are difficult to apply at the bedside. You know, we always say, well, we're going to follow the KDGO guidelines now that somebody has early AKI and we're going to do all these things. But the reality is how we get to that diagnosis, how do we get there is really a clinical diagnosis. I always think of it this way. If the radar is not high and the barriers in terms of looking what you're looking at are not low, it's very challenging to have that opinion that you have AKI. One of my CV surgeons said, should right now be the time we send off a test because I think this patient had a significant enough event that could go into AKI. And the answer simply is yes, because it is a clinical diagnosis based upon the excellent clinical acumen of us as clinicians, as well as the excellent clinical acumen of actually looking at the diagnostic tools we have in our toolbox to assess somebody for AKI. Again, how do we improve global outcomes of the KDGO deadline? We know that AKI is defined as any of the following, increase in serum creatinine by 0.3 within 48 hours, or an increase in serum creatinine to 1.5 times baseline, which is known to have occurred within the seven days prior, or a urine volume of less than 0.5 mLs per kilo. So I just want you to think in your head, and, and, and this is what I do. Every time I see a new drug or a new treatment management strategy come up, or I hear about new therapy for somebody, and I often think back to the early days of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, I often think to myself, how many patients in my clinical practice have I seen that have done this? And I think to myself, I have a sweet little old lady with creatinine of 
and the next one's 0.9, her creatinine now has gone up by greater than 0.3 in a 48-hour window. However, it's going to still show up as normal on my, on my screening or on my lab test. It's not going to have the two little stars next to it or being red, depending on which system you have. So it requires me as a clinician, whether it's me, my pharmacist, my bedside critical care nurse, my medical student, um, my resident, my fellow, or my mid-level, one of us has to have that clinical acumen to say, wait a minute, something has clearly changed here that may lead or may have this patient be at risk for AKI. And then I have to think about how do I approach confirming or not confirming that diagnosis. A recent study found that one in three patients with acute kidney injury were readmitted to the hospital or ED or died within 30 days of hospital discharge. Tests to assess the early risk in conjunction with clinical evaluation can improve patient outcomes. And I like to go through that before I say, let's look at Marcia, Carlotta, Roberto, Andreas, Marcus, and Jorge. Which one of these patients would be one of our patients who could develop AKI? I'm going to argue all of them. But I'm also going to argue that many of us are going to lean toward the elderly patient the mildly obese patient, but in reality, any patient on this list, any patient we're looking at in our ICU has a risk of developing AKI and has that secondary risk of prolonged revisits or readmission to the hospital. It is difficult to diagnose. If it was simple, just like most things in critical care medicine, anybody can do it. Acute kidney injury has often been described as a silent killer. And I, you know, I drive to work up a 20 mile road every day. And on both sides of the road, we have two competing hospital systems. On one side of the road, we have the fastest ER in the country. Uh, you know the signs of stroke, you know the signs of a heart attack. On the other side of the road, we have a sepsis sign up now. Um, we have a heart attack stroke. Uh, again, we have uh, um, other signs for um, other things, diabetes. But nobody ever has a sign up saying, could you have AKI or could you develop AKI? And the reality is if you think about cost, if you think about where the cost is, it's an AKI long-term. Patients don't die. Patients have long-term chronic illness. Early detection and risk assessment of AKI is often misdiagnosed and underrecognized. 0. 0.6 to 0.9. How many of us would say this patient may be at risk for AKI? One thing we're seeing at, and one of the things we're seeing more and more in medicine is patients have tremendous number of susceptibilities. Very challenging to get a history. Have you had AKI before? Have you been in trouble before? When they gave you your dye for your STEMI, did you have a problem with that? And now we've actually made you dry because you've had a cabbage done. And we also know that we have chronic exposures. Patients are getting multiple medications. The whole surviving sepsis campaign re requires us to guess an antibiotic very quickly. But what we know is there is no single risk factor or disease state that I can say, aha, you're at risk. Certainly hypertension, diabetes, previous AKI. But the reality is, is that some of those patients even don't go into AKI. The problem is, is that if we have a delay in recognizing AKI, we can eventually lead to irreversible injury or we can lead to a severe decline in the GFR, which may rapidly become, after discharge, longstanding ESRD. This is what I think when I think of, uh, of uh, AKI. How do I use a functional biomarker to give me an early marker that something is bad? So our functional biomarkers have always been BUN, threatening, and really urine output, for want of a better word, and we have lots of ways of measuring that now. But what we know is oftentimes those functional biomarkers can lie significantly behind other indicators because you can clearly know, and everybody on this call knows that we've seen patients who have had a uh, BUM of 24, the next one's 30, the next one's 40, their creatinine's 111314, and we're like, well, oh, they're in renal failure. Well, wouldn't it have been nice to know before that 1-4 or even before the 1-3 hit? And we know the risk factors. Every one of us does this for a living. Sepsis, septicemia, septic shock, hypotension, uh, decreased blood pressure at home, the little old lady found down in the nursing home, poor little old lady found down in her own home, pneumonia, uh, same thing, sepsis, cardiogenic shock. I think one of the great unrecognized problems 
we see these patients that EFs go from 30 to 25 to 20 to 15. They go into septic shock and with cardiogenic shock, one of the most challenging things to treat. You know, I, doing anesthesia and I'm in the operating room all day tomorrow, you know, major surgery, I think for anybody over 80, a hernia is major surgery. You know, they are, they are elderly. They have other comorbid illnesses. You have to be very cautious about how you manage them volume-wise. Cardiac surgery, you know, I think to myself, I gave a talk in 1980 about indication or contraindications for cardiac surgery. I think they've become the indications for cardiac surgery. A lot of our drugs are nephrotoxics. We give a lot of radio contrast. We always seem to have a patient who have a question of bowel or perforated bowel or some other bowel disease in the ER, getting radio contrast. We have hypovolemia for various reasons, sometimes induced by us. And then we have other medications. Patient risk factors, advanced age. When you run the hospital next to the villages, a lot of advanced age. Females have a higher risk. African-Americans for various reasons. Chronic kidney disease that we may not be aware of. Challenging to get that information. Chronic disease, heart, lung, and liver. Diabetes, especially poorly controlled. Advanced cancer. Anemia. And then, of course, dehydration. Could be from various reasons. Could be self-induced. Could be that they couldn't get the fluid. Many reasons. I often think when I look at this, this slide, I want to know when the kidney's damaged. I want to know when that risk has occurred. I don't want to know when the GFR is down and I already have dysfunction. And worse yet, when the kidney's already rapidly approaching death, because it may be very challenging for me to get it back. And then I'm going to have to go with some sort of renal replacement therapy and potentially changing the whole course of this patient's uh, paradigm of life. Well, it's not only fatal, but in many cases, reversible when appropriately managed. We know that AKI claims about 2 million lives a year, but among admitted, pa admitted patients diagnosed via traditional methods who died from hospital-acquired AKI, about 31% have avoidable AKI. You know, I often think back to the old, uh, the old hit days when we were giving platelets to people that were chewing them up. We know that 43% had an unacceptable delay in diagnosis. I think of that 0 0.6 to 0.9, even 0 0.6 to 1.2 in our lab would come out as normal. A high acuity, a high index of suspicion. 54% of people actually had inadequate risk assessment. You know, it's one of the things I always ask when our team does rounds. I say, what, what's our risk here? You know, the urine output's going down. Creatinine's 1.2, came in at 0.9. Did we do something to hasten this? Well, they got Lasix in the ER because they thought they were in failure, and really it's pneumonia. Okay, well, that certainly is a problem. And now we have to reassess this patient. We know that 79% of moderate to severe AKI cases were not identified by the reporting physicians. And that's all coming. It may not be an intensivist. Could be the hospitalist. Could be the family practitioner. Could be somebody else. Uh, the uh, the uh, surgeon who's managing the patient doesn't realize or have that in inquisitive and inclusive nature that we have to look at all the labs. I would argue a better predictive tool another tool in my toolbox, I love having tools in my toolbox, gets me a chance to reduce the burden of AKI and help improve my chance of reversing AKI. You know, I always love cost slides because if you want to have a conversation with administration, you want to have a conversation with the C-suite, you want to have a conversation with uh, the people who provide money for diagnostic tests, I always say look at kidney injury. The economic and health burden of AKI is staggering. We found in our hospital, it is actually the twice the number of even our most uh, worst thing, which is cancer. It has two to three times worth length of stay. Absolutely no, no question about it. I would think that you know two to three times hospital cost, I tend to agree with that, but I like to include in my hospital cost placement, the length of stay and other things that happen. So we do know that as those costs go up, we increase the length of stay. It enhances our readmission. We just talked about that. Patients with a kidney injury have an increased risk of readmission. You guys know what readmissions mean. No reimbursement for anybody if they can tie back a single diagnosis to it. We know that it can lead to chronic kidney disease. You know, John Kellum has showed that uh, patients who have had some sort of kidney damage, a second episode can be nearly catastrophic for them in terms of worsening their renal status. And mortality can be six times to 13 times worse. Very challenging as you obviously know, that oftentimes the CKD may not be on the top of the list. It could be the hypotension, could be the cardiomyopathy, could be something else. But certainly at the top of that list with mortality would be CKD, 
And it's significant when you think it can be up to six times worse than a routine patient. We know that sepsis and acute kidney injury are often comorbidities. And I think this is really an important statement to make. You know, I was reading a, um, a article, I think yesterday, talking about the surviving sepsis campaign, maybe quicker, maybe faster, uh, maybe even more of a, uh, almost a, a code-like situation. One of our hospitals uh, announces their sepsis alerts overhead and has two members of a rapid response team defend on that patient. Uh, and maybe that's right. But we do know that sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. I'm septic, I'm infected, my blood pressure is down. It is very common. It is number four in clinically addressable potential inpatient complications. I think at our place it's number two, but globally it's number four. It can be dead dangerous. It is very complex. It can be deadly. It can lead to other organ system failure. It can lead to limb loss, extended length of stay, even complications related to its treatment, i.e. antibiotics. And it leads oftentimes to broad spectrums, which is only going to enhance our patients getting, or all of us being exposed to more resistant bacteria. You know, I remember hearing about the first time about an ESBL, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's bad. Now they get it reported out so quickly, I can't imagine what's going to be next in line for us. We know that AKI often follows it. AKI is a rapid loss of kidney function, but is not limited to acute renal failure, and it can just be acute kidney injury. It is the number one in clinical addressable potential. How important is it? Well, CMS out of that last year that new onset acute kidney injury and a patient that you didn't expect it is reportable now. Not surprising. It's the number one clinically addressable potential inpatient complication. It is a common complication of sepsis for various reasons. Under resuscitation, um, you know, patients have a prolonged tracted or prolonged protracted period of, uh, of shock. Um, we know that the outcomes with AKI actually are compromised and patients can get sicker. And antibiotic exposures, most of them, especially when we give Vancogent and some of our other antibiotics, can actually be nephrotoxic. So if you think to yourself, sepsis 1.6 million patients, AKI 3.2 million patients. When you look at the combination of these two together, it is rather frightening. You know, as I always say, when you think about critical care, what we do is we try to pull a lot of our patients back from the brink. We try to reverse end organ damage, whether it be long-term or whether it be new. And our goal, especially as clinicians, is to diagnose, treat, and manage early so that we can potentially reverse significant comorbidity and organ function. Sepsis and AKI have significant economic complications. Why is sepsis so hot? Why is sepsis so important? It's even mentioned uh, on uh, some of our news programs these days. Cost about $15 billion. And we know it is deadly. 16%, almost one in five patients will have a mortality from sepsis. 15% will have a uh, mortality, overall mortality rate for uh, sepsis long-term, whether they go home or not go home. And if you look at sepsis compared to the routine patient population, it's about eight times. Combine that with AKI. AKI is about $10 billion. It's a capitated cost. The mortality is actually higher in hospital than sepsis at about 20%. And the overall mortality in those patients long-term is about 25%. And if you think about it in terms of inpatient, it has about a 10 times. And when I think of the cost, I think is very much similar to cirrhosis. The cost of cirrhosis is, is about seven to $10 billion. The familial cost, the loss of job, the loss of being able to have an income, the loss of other components of life adds about another five to $8 billion to that. AKI is not that different. The patient has to be transported. Their, their loved one becomes their caregiver. It has a complicated group of uh, processes with it. And at the back end of that, if they're not well cared for, well managed, they often develop sepsis long term and have a second process. So if we think about cost, if we think about money, if we think about how we as clinicians can provide some of the greatest care to our patients is to avoid these incredibly costly processes that occur that lead to end organ or end organ damage. Again, mortality doubles in patients with sepsis and acute kidney injury. 
I remember the first time I looked at this and I was just absolutely blown away thinking about this, that if I add renal failure and add somebody who actually developed sepsis with it, I nearly double my mortality from sepsis alone. I think we all can relate to that. We often have the septic shock patient not doing well, we're on a couple of pressors, then their kidneys start going. We try multiple ways to boot the kidneys up or get them to recover or at least stay normal. And in the end, that the fails because they go into AKI, they get more septic, um, their white cells stop working. We end up having to struggle to sort out what antibiotics to give them. And the reality is, if you think about nearly doubling your mortality, it's just staggering to me that, you know, sepsis and AKI, I often wonder to myself, have you had a stroke? Are you having an MI? Uh, do you know the signs of a stroke or an MI? I would say, do you know the signs of sepsis and what comes with it? Or do you know the signs of AKI? Again, in patients with septic shock, we know that any delay in antibiotics can increase mortality by 7.6% every hour you delay it. It's the entire concept that we do now of getting patients antibiotics as quickly as we can in that timely window in the emergency department. We use a lot of procalcitonins down there. They're very high. It proves that we really need to get the antibiotics in quickly. We are actually looking at patients who have bumps in creatinine that we don't have any marker before. 1.8, we don't know where they're at. We will oftentimes send a biomarker in the ER before we get them upstairs because just like everybody else, beds are always at a premium at our facility. What about procalcitonin? Well, procalcitonin is another biomarker, a fascinating biomarker. It is produced by numerous organs at their bacterial pro-inflammatory stimulation. It rises in about three to six hours. Its half-life is in about 20 to 24 hours. And we really know that the early identification and risk assessment, PCT, is part of that. I know everybody in this uh, call probably can tell me a story about using PCT, ferritins, uh, CRPs when they were managing COVID patients. And we saw PCT levels that I actually didn't. I saw ferritin levels that I didn't know were humanly possible. I saw CRP levels that were all consistently in the upper 20s, and I saw PCT levels that were very high as well. So we do know that this inflammatory stimulation, especially in the septic patient, actually uh, gives us another tool saying this patient is probably critically ill, they are probably septic, and it's very suggestive, not diagnostic, suggestive of a bacterial or some sort of infection, and they certainly were very high in our COVID patients. We often thought that viral infections do not simulate PT, PT, PCT expression, but the reality is, is that COVID may have been different. Maybe it was the overall inflammatory response. Maybe it was a secondary pneumonia, which most of our patients had, but levels that were absolutely astronomical. And in a lot of our patients, we track the PCT as we start de-escalating antibiotics, which is absolutely key these days. If you look in uh, PCT guided antibiotic stewardship and well about stewardship these days versus usual care for hospitalized patients, that if you use PCTs, you can reduce antibiotic therapy days by 5.8. If I'm guesstimating if a patient needs antibiotics and the PCT may be seven or eight, and very quickly it's down to one or two, I will de-escalate very quickly and follow them. I think it reduces length of stay, maybe not overall in the hospital because oftentimes patients have a completion course of antibiotics, but certainly in the ICU by about 3.6 days. It can reduce mechanical ventilation days by two, which reduces your risk of getting a secondary pneumonia, which you and I both know can lead to complications. It can leave savings for patients for about $11,000. I know that my um, infectious disease guys along with us, if we're managing the antibiotics, will often de-escalate very quickly. Uh, percentage of sepsis with antibiotic resistance was small in the PCT arm, not big, about 6.4%. But you and I both know that, you know, we're running out of antibiotics. If you're getting old like me, you're worried about what antibiotic you're going to get when you get sick. And it's one of the things I remain absolutely convinced that we can do a better job with. And it can certainly reduce C. diff infections because if we get fewer antibiotics for shorter courses of time, Hopefully, we'll have fewer C. diff patients. If you think about AKI, it's actually more interesting than that as well. If you have AKI, it actually can be worse for an individual than a STEMI. And I say this because I see those STEMI signs. I have, there's a sign I drive by, been there for two years, it just changes colors and, 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 and um, faces on it. But it says the same thing. 
you know, one hour to resolve a STEMI, which is the goal. But nobody says one hour to resolve of AKI. Yet I look at this and I think to myself, acute kidney injury has more of a severe outcome, i.e. mortality, almost twice as much as a STEMI. Yet we have STEMI groups. I remember um, um, STEMI call. I remember hearing a very um, excellent uh, nephrologist at a children's hospital say that maybe we should have a AKI team. Maybe we should have an AKI alert so that all hands on deck come and reduce the risk. I think we can do that ourselves. KDGO guideline, what we've been doing for years, knowing how to manage AKI could potentially do all of that. Again, we know that surgery associated AKI leads to poor outcomes. Um, There may be some component of this. Most recently a paper in anesthesia said that even a cumulative 10 minutes of uh, decreased MAP uh, from about 10% of the average MAP can lead to a post-operative borderline AKI. Um, and it's cumulative. It doesn't mean 10 minutes all at one time. It can be two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, six minutes. And having been an anesthesiologist and seen that, it's certainly a risk. I mean, I know some of our surgeons like to run them dry. Some surgeons like to run them hypotensive so they don't bleed. But I remind them when I'm in the operating room that neither of those are actually considered standard of care. We really should keep them eugalemic as we push more and more in that pathway. And we know we have a tenfold increase for hospital mortality and a decrease for survival up to 15 years if they had an episode of CKD. I always feel badly for my patients when they have chronic kidney disease or develop AKI and they get up to about a stage two, stage three, and I get them back to a stage two. I know that I have shortened a component of their life. And I know that if I had stopped or created not let that happen, it would have been better off long term again. Clinical observation, clinical acumen, clinical diagnosis. We know that uh, cardiac surgery uh, is is expensive. We know that AKI is a significant component and problem of it. We know that up to 40% of patients develop AKI. Most places have about 12 to 14% if you look at it. If you look at those patient populations, the risk-adjusted average cost of care for those patients who develop AKI is very significant. It leads to an increased length of stay in the ICU, an increased length of stay in the hospital, and an increased cost. It also leads to an increased readmission rate. A lot of hospitals now have gone to a capitated Medicare reimbursement for for cardiac surgery. So you have to be very cautious and very uh, um, cognitive that if you have this increased length of stay by three, four, or five days, even up to uh, higher than 10 days, that you may actually cost or actually may have a problem in terms of reimbursement because there's no way to recoup that that, that money. In the STS data, short of death and return to the OR, it remains one of the biggest uh, harbingers that something bad happened. So again, a very common surgery, a very common place. In our CV um, ICU was one of the first places we started using biomarkers for AKI. And very quickly, we developed a protocol that helped us aggressively treat, manage, and more importantly, identify those patients. What are we talking about? Like procalcitonin, another biomarker. This is the NephroCheck test, TIMP2, IGFPP7. It is the only clear FDA cleared test, and I want you to remember this word, to assess for risk assessment. It is not diagnosing kidney injury. It is not saying your patient's going into kidney injury. In fact, I'm going to argue that the risk assessment in the right hand should help you have a chance to reverse that kidney injury before we end up with that great kidney on the right hand side. It is intended in use. It is intended for use in conjunction with, and I want you to remember this too, clinical evaluation in patients who currently have or have had within the past 24 hours some sort of acute cardiovascular or respiratory compromise and may or may not be in the ICU. Again, not all my nephro checks are in the ICU. I have ER patients, I have PCU patients that I've been asked to assess and I just don't have a bed for them. But if we think they have an injury, if we think the shoe fits, we put the sock on it or work. And I remind myself, it is low hanging fruit. It is a sample of fresh urine. No blood, fresh urine that I can send down and I can look for these two proteins 
to tell me that there is potentially some damage to the kidney that may lead to a risk assessment of AKI. And that creatinine that went from 0.6 to 0.9 is the perfect patient who may have a little bit of a decrease in urine output, that slight pump in creatinine, and actually give me a tool to say, aha, this patient's at risk and they really haven't bumped their creatinine that much yet. Maybe I can do something to reverse the course. In fact, it's kind of fascinating. I did a study eons ago looking at one of the early markers for fluid uh, kidney damage in soldiers, but this is kind of interesting. The myomarkers TIMP2 and IGFBP7 are produced during kidney stress before kidney damage or long-term damage occurs. What it is, is, is it's two proteins, one in the proximal, one in the distal tubule, who actually respond to stress. What they do is that cell stops in G1 cycle arrest and prevents cells from actually or dividing, which then can lead to damage. Those injured cells then start secreting these two proteins to say that I have a kidney at risk. And one of them is in the proximal tubule and one of them is in the distal tubule. If you think about it, the two places we look at for early AKI, proximal and distal tubule. So they're actually proteins. They're no different than when a, uh, a, a heart cell dies and it releases troponin. They're no different than when a brain cell dies and it releases enolase. They're no different than when a muscle cell dies and it releases CPK. These are two proteins that are released specifically from the kidney in response to a stress that has occurred to decrease perfusion, increase damage to the kidney. And as we said before, it is a risk assessment. It is not saying you're going into renal fire. It is not saying you're going to have it. It is saying that the kidney is at risk because it was underperfused or had damage from another reason, antibiotics, second die load, other reasons that have now increased that risk assessment. It is an improvement over what we have done. It is a prospective examination of a mechanically <clears throat> relevant biomarker for AKI to assess for early kidney stress. One of the things I commonly hear is I hear, when should I order it? I always say, if you think of it and you think your patient's at risk, you should have already ordered it. That's what my CV surgeon tells me. He says, if Guzzi thinks, or we think that this patient's at risk, or I think I should order it because now's my time to have a chance to reverse it. And I think that is very, very true. It is low hanging fruit. It is just urine. It goes down, you get a result back. If it's positive, you can decide what to do with it. If it's negative, I think it's just as important. I can take that off my plate now because this kidney is not at risk. It can change very quickly. I can do it again, which we do all the time when somebody has worsening status, but right now I'm okay. Over 300 candidate AKI bar markers to include Engol, Cystatin C, Kim-1 were studied and analyzed via two multi-center trials across 37 sites. TIMP2, and IGFBP7 were validated in 1,200 patients. And this is the important part. These patients had all the diseases we talked about in KD go at risk, sepsis, shock, major surgery, and trauma. It wasn't cherry picking these. There were these patients had exactly those amount of stress that we know secondary to an oxidative or poor perfusion state. In fact, if you look across the board, it is the only FDA clear biomarker for acute kidney injury. The TIMP2 and IGFPP7 independently achieve an AUC of 0.77 and 0.75 respectively for AKI stage two or three within 12 to 36 hours. Important there. So a little old lady comes in from home, found down on the floor, maybe in seen last time, seen eight to 12 hours ago. I'm going to get that test right away. Somebody in acute injury on the floor who was doing great, I'm probably going to wait that eight to 12 hours to get it to see what my kidney function is. Really important to put the timing of the test with the timing of the patient. We know that the combination of TIMP2 and IGFPP7 exhibited an AUC of 0.8 for the development of AKI within 12 hours, it makes it even more. And it is a simple multiplication of the two uh, urinary biomarkers that gives you your number and your risk factor, i.e., greater than 0.3, patient has a high risk of having some sort of stress to the kidney which may or may not lead to AKI long-term. Again, it gives you a risk score. Um, I, you know, we often say this in our office that a negative risk score is equally as important as the positive risk. 
A positive risk score means I can now got to move forward, do something, go through my okay Digo guidelines, maybe get pharmacy involved to look at all the drugs. A negative score means, okay, the urine output's down, but that's not really secondary to probably AKI, even though I'm going to keep it in the back of my mind. It's going to give me a little more leeway to think that maybe it's not the kidneys that are at risk, something else is at risk. Again, it's an early renal alarm. You know, just like I heard a very uh, excellent speaker say, maybe we need a renal alarm team. Maybe we need a code STEMI or a code renal or a code kidney so that we can reverse this, especially when we think of the cost of this and the mortality associated with it. The nephro check test is indicated for use in patients who have had or have had within the past 24 hours an acute cardiovascular or respiratory compromise. Think of those six patients we showed you up front. Think of your ICU. Go back and think of the last 12 patients you treated in your ICU. How many do you think, huh, could they have had some sort of AKI? And if we wait for clinical biomarkers, and creatinine decreased urine output to give us that answer, that can be a 24 to 36 hour process. And should we assess these patients because they are at risk? And can we sound that alarm and get a risk assessment for AKI? A negative score of less than 0.3 says that the patient is unlikely to develop moderate to severe AKI within 12 hours. I think a negative thing score is huge. I got a little old lady here on outputs, 18 cc's, 20 cc's an hour. Crannin's holding its own. It's AKI score comes back at 0.3. That's off my list. I have somebody I'm not quite sure how long they've been down for. Crannin comes back at 1.8, 1.4, 1.8. I don't have any information on it. My AKI or my nephro check comes back at 1.2. I've got a problem. It's not dead kidneys. It's a kidney that it's a risk. I have now sounded the early renal alarm system, and I have done a risk assessment that this patient is high risk. Now I can potentially track something to tell me whether this ongoing damage isn't occurring or if I can reverse it. Both scores are equally as important. And I think we often forget how important the negative risk score is. It quantifies the risk of AKI. It is very high sensitivity and very acceptable specificity. Again, nothing is perfect. We know that levels greater than 0.3 give us a specificity of about, a sensitivity of about 92%. If you would bump that up to 0.6, it certainly is better. However, you're going to miss a small percentage of patients. So our answer simply is we go with 0.3, we look at 0.3, we look at 0.3 with the susceptibility of the patient in mind. Do they have a risk that we are looking at? If they do, then we certainly use that 0.3 cutoff as our number. Okay, a lot of people say go 0.6. We've never chosen to do that. Again, it's been established based on two clinical studies, 408 patients and 126 patients. And you can see the sensitivity, and we just talked about specificity. The high sensitivity and negative predictive value are important in risk assessment. We know that the majority of patients who will go on to develop AKI test positive, they are greater than 0.3. Few patients, in fact, I can only ever think of one we had, and it was secondary to a drug they took that we didn't know they took have a negative test that will go on to develop AKI. Probably should have risk reassessed her later on. However, we did not get a clear story what she had taken at home. Patients with positive AKI risk score have a greater than 25% chance of developing moderate or severe AKI within 12 hours. In two studies, the positive predictive value of the nephro check was found to be 27% and 31% at the 0.3 cutoff and the specificity was found to be 46 and 51% at the 0.3 cutoff. Again, certainly higher cutoff, higher sensitivity, but it lets you know that your patient's at risk. I always like this slide because, you know, we have been as intensivists, we have seen study after study come out in perfect critically ill patients. And I remind myself, there is no perfect critically ill patient. I want to see, um, um, Patients who have diabetes, heart disease, COPD, pneumonia, ARDS, or previous kidney disease. That's what I was. How did this test perform in those patients? How did that drug perform in those patients? And what we found was that in those patients that um, have multiple other comorbidities, 
the AKI risk scores are not elevated relative to the results for a healthy subject for patients who have chronic morbidities, i.e., the long-standing chronic morbidity did not increase your, um, your, your severity score. It was actually in tune with the healthy patient. So you can use this in our chronically ill patients as a tool for assessment of early AKI. My absolute favorite slide. I'm a visual guy. I like visuality. Um, so if I send a nephro check, the TIMP2 IGFBP7, and I have somebody who's at risk, and I think they're at risk, if I want to wait for the serum creatinine, which are biomarkers, um, they can take time. They can take a while to wash out. It can take up to 48 hours for them to become elevated. And if your creatinine starts going up, and we've all done the dog study in med school, we have about a loss of about 50% of our functional kidneys. I like to think that we as clinicians, just like in troponin land, enolase land, and CPK land and rhabdo, we're smarter than that. I like to think that we know that one of those six patients we just talked about had this. I like to think that we know that that patient had a hypotensive episode or a history of hypotension with a poor cardiomyopathy. I like to think we know that they're at risk now and six to 12 hours later because of that, or because they came in and were already found down, I'm going to send a nephro check off on him because I want to see if my kidneys are stressed. Again, I remind people, it's not telling you're going into renal failure. We do know that percentage too, but it identifies the kidneys that it's stressed because in my world, somewhere just outside this little blue box on the left where I get to injury is where I can make a difference. Everything past that point, it may be challenging or I may have missed my opportunity to fix them. So just like everything else we do, 24-7 monitoring, assessment, looking at the patient, you know, doing a lot of chart reviews over the multiple years, there's always an answer there if we just could dig deep enough. How long were they hypotensive for? You know, did it happen in the OR that suddenly for 20 minutes they were struggling to get a blood pressure? Not uncommon in a heart case. Not uncommon in a redo. Not uncommon in a patient with severe cardiomyopathy. Or... Were they at home getting more short of breath with very low blood pressure before they finally came to the ER? All the things that can lead to acute kidney injury. It is the only FDA cleared test for the, assess the risk assessment of acute kidney injury. It's specific for AKI. It's a 20 minute urine test. 10 cc's fresh urine. Can't take it out of the bag, it's gotta be fresh urine. Um, it is a low capital expense. You know, my CFO, Approved it very quickly. We looked at our first year, our savings on, on, on dialysis, and she said, you can keep doing this test, and it clearly works again and again. So who's at risk? Is it Marcia, Carlotta, Roberto, Andreas, Marcus, or George? Well, interestingly enough, it's the one I wouldn't pick, it's Carlotta, because we know that she's a 68-year-old African-American female. She had a pre-op body weight of about 60 kilograms. She had hypertension, she had COPD, she had a previous history of colon cancer, and her baseline serum creatinine was about 0.4. She has surgery, and on post-op day number two, after her AP resection, she has a sepsis diagnosis. A little febrile, a little hypotensive. She's mechanically ventilated. Her creatinine creeps up to 0.5, and concerns are very risk, real. She clearly has a risk of sepsis. Her PCP comes back mildly elevated, so that is certainly on my risk page. We know that the early identification of AKI risk and the use of the KDGO care bundle significantly reduces AKI severity. With dynamic measurement of the risk of acute kidney injury, there will be an opportunity to initiate timely and appropriate preventive therapy. All the KDGO bundle, fluid, some way to monitor cardiac output, cardiac index, keeping them away from nephrotoxins, keeping them away from diuretics, all those things that seem so common in our business should go into place, especially for somebody at high risk. As well, potentially other ways that we can do things. Discontinuing nephrotoxin, changing doses, volume status. Again, I, I harp on this all the time. You should never be volume depleted in an ICU. By the same token, you should probably never be severely volume overloaded. We have so many tools now that we can use to measure volume and more importantly, perfusion pressure. Human dynamic monitoring. Invasive, non-invasive, it doesn't matter. There are plenty of ways to monitor it now. Monitoring frequency of serum creatinine urine output, 
you know, we have these urimeters now that give us an hourly total. Ours actually feed into our computer and tell us our urine output and potentially an early nephrology consult to see if there's anything we could do differently. Here's the KDGO bundle, which we all know. You have a high AKI risk score in this patient. It gives you strategic recommendations for appropriate intervention, discontinued nephrotoxins, volume status, uh, functional hemodynamic monitoring. I think that's one of the most important things. Monitoring serum creatinine, we know hyperglycemia worsens the status as we all are very concerned about our blood sugar. Uh, try to stay away from radial contrast dyes. I think one of the biggest things we've done is that when we see an elevation or we see somebody at risk or somebody who comes back positive, we really try to avoid any further dye or we try to see how much dye they may have received beforehand and, and are concerned, uh, especially for the random going down for the head CT, abdominal CT, et cetera. We do a non-invasive diagnostic workup. We all have ultrasounds available in ICUs these days. We look at the drugs. We consider uh, RRT, RRT very quickly. And again, either ICU admission or at least an advanced uh, um, PCU. And we avoid all central lines because of the risk of infection. Again, the consensus recommends early intervention to decrease risk of stage two and stage three. You can see that if you get an early KDGO bundle in place that you can reduce um, your uh, patient's risk factors. However, it's not simply enough to do this. But again, the KDGO bundle, I put it in my note all the time when I see somebody, you know, we can pull it over and say, we're going to do this, this, and this. So again, we know her numbers, baseline creatinine is 0.4, day two, we snow the 0.5. On day four, she was given a strinam, uh, flagell, and vancomycin. She's on pressures now to maintain a systolic blood pressure of greater than 100. Creatinine's now bumped up to 0.9. Remember our definition. She's greater than a 0.3 increase in, uh, in uh, 48 hours. Urine output's about 30 cc's an hour. Would anybody do anything different here? Well, I would argue that it might be time to think about what's going on with these pressures. What's her volume status? Does she need to be squeezed, which we know decreases perfusion? Um, is there something else we can do? Well, the PCT is now down to 1.2. Well, um, that's pretty good. So our antibiotics are working, potentially de-escalate them. However, I'm looking at that, that, that creatinine bump, and even though it may not shock anybody, it certainly is concerning to me that it's not the 0.9 from a baseline of 0.4. I'm going to go ahead and send a nephro check on her. Constantly evaluating, I could have sent it day two, sent it day four, it doesn't matter. And my score comes back at 3.4 telling me that she has a risk of developing AKI and may already be on the pathway to have that happen. We know that DDoS branch PCT known earlier to being sooner. We know that the FDA cleared test. We do it as risk assessment. I use it a lot to de-escalate my patient's antibiotics or think about what I'm treating them for, trying to pick the best possible choices based on their disease process. We know that it monitors treatment response and prognosis in patients with severe sepsis and septic shock. Clearly, if Carlotta was going up, it's a different decision making for her compared to somebody else. But again, we do know that as our patients go up and do not de-escalate, they tend to require more and more antibiotics and are sicker. We know that the NephroCheck is a renal alarm system. It is not a diagnostic tool for AKI. It is not a diagnostic tool saying you're going into renal failure. It is a tool saying that your patient, based upon your clinical acumen, based upon your clinical knowledge, is at risk for AKI. It is low-hanging fruit. It is urine. It is looking for two specific proteins that are produced in the proximal and distal tubule to say that this kidney may have been hyperperfused, this kidney may have been damaged from dye, this kidney may have been damaged from a hypoxic state. It is highly sensitive and has a very acceptable specificity for risk assessment. It's not perfect. There is no perfect test. But it gives me a moderate to severe AKI assessment. I love the next line. It is not elevated with other chronic comorbidities, which we all know most of our patients have. And it gives me an early identification of patients at risk. So I have the opportunity to either shift, change, or institute therapies that could potentially reduce my risk, i.e. the KD go bundle. Thereby, if I've done all this, I can impact morbidity, mortality, and remember what we said about length of stay, kidney injury is very expensive and costly and potentially decrease my costs associated with moderate to severe AKI.
Again, if you look at it, assess for uh, the PCT, monitor its therapy, discontinue uh, when the antibiotics go or decrease your antibiotics. Nephro check, identify the risk of the AKI risk score, i.e. a risk awareness, stratify, triage that patient to lower risk if they don't have that. Again, I think a negative is equally as important as a positive, if not more, and mitigate. It aids the intervention that we can do to implement some sort of prefer preferred kidney sparing strategy to reduce the severe consequences, cost, life-saving changes in acute kidney injury. There's a form called the uh, chronic renal failure or acute renal failure form, which is an international form. And I've listened to a few of the lectures on there from the family members that have had patients go into uh, acute kidney injury and require dialysis. And I just think of the incredible burden that we place on them. It's very similar to listen to some of the hepatic encephalopathy uh, discussions about cost and length of care. Again, it's gathered in third party sources. Um, and again, you can see clearly here our disclosure. And with that being said, I believe I have 27 minutes after the hour. I will try to keep it under an hour because that's the best person you're ever going to hear. And I hopefully have done that. I hopefully have stimulated a few questions. If not, maybe I've kept you awake whatever time zone you are through your dinner hour. And again, I want to thank you and uh, thank uh, my society, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, for giving us the opportunity to have this discussion. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Gezi. We always appreciate your insights and, um, and your real-world experience with the Nefertek test. Um, so we have received a, a few questions, so uh, we'll just kind of um, address these, certainly let you catch your breath for a moment. Um, so one question is, um, is the early renal alarm shown to actually affect outcome, outcomes or, or the rate of AKI, or has that not been investigated yet? It's a great question. So I will speak to our own data. So um, we started tracking ours from day one when we were using it, and uh, we have reams of data. And uh, it's interesting, when we first put the test in place, we didn't really know what we were doing with it. We know we had a marker. We know that that marker would give us a, uh, an early renal alarm. And we had some bundles in place for resuscitation fluid, uh, monitoring um, cardiac output, cardiac index, uh, SVD if they were intubated, SVRI. And for about the first 200 patients, we had a, a fairly decent success rate, about a 50% reduction in AKI. But as we matured our process, and I, I like to say maturity comes with the nurses telling you don't know what you're doing. As we matured our process and our nurses really took a hold of this process and began realizing that they were the ones at the bedside who saw this and saw the drop in pressures and everything else, uh, we dropped our AKI rate significantly. I think we were at in the CVIC of 12.1%. Uh, most recent number I saw was 1.9%. In our septic shock patients, we were at about 14 and a half to almost 14.8%. We're down to about 5% now. Um, I don't know if we can get much lower in some of those categories because we have a very elderly population. I like to have younger patients, but the answer is yes, and that's our own data. Other trials have shown very similar data that it can help reduce. Now, I want to I want to put a baby caveat on that. I think it's one of the great unknowns in our patients. Um, we do know, especially in people who have rhabdomyolysis and go into AKI, that if they have another event or another process that leads them to go into AKI, that they have a higher risk of chronic renal failure after that. So there may be something that sustains the damage to the kidney, but I would like to think that at least I can keep them um, functional nephrons for as long as possible. Excellent. Um, so this is a comment and a question. It's kind of a future directed type question. Um, the comment is, I feel like the kidneys are so fragile. In the future, do you think there will be a role for empiric CRRT or something similar to protect the kidneys before injury? Well, I don't know if CRRT actually protects the kidneys. I think CRRT is what we think it is, continuous renal replacement therapy. So it helps replace what the kidneys are doing. So I don't know if the answer is it will actually uh, replace the kidney. I do know that there's plenty of data now showing that early CRT in septic shock patients, severely acidotic patients, other patients, and, um, that's my nephew coming home and my dog, um, I, in those kind of patients. I do know that in that patient population, that early CRT clearly has some benefit. And, you know, I, I've been doing this a long time. And I remember five years ago, if I'd have said CRT, two nephrologists would have come in and tried to lock me in my office and not let me out. 
Uh, now I say CRT, we present the case, we talk about it, and 99% of the time we say, yep, great idea, let's do CRRT. So I don't know if it's going to replace or preserve the kidney. I do know that we do it to help preserve the um, things the kidney does, acidosis, electrolytes, et cetera. Uh, easy way to get volume out, uh, keep patients euvolemic rather than let them get fluid overloaded. Um, I like to think that we are seeing the first wave of these uh, biomarkers and that at some point in the future, we're going to have a whole other wave of these, which is even going to be more exciting. Right. Excellent. Um, so the another common question. So excellent presentation. Um, is there any work with pediatric patients? Yes, there is, but that's not my bailiwick. Um, I do know at least three outstanding pediatric nephrologists who speak far greater than I do about this uh, test. Um, I do think it works in them. Um, I don't treat pediatric patients. Unfortunately, I do get some 12 year olders in my ICU that are kind of big um, and they can't go to the regular ICU. They're bigger than me, which fascinates me when you're 12 years old. But um, we do use it in them. Uh, there may be some uh, better ways to look at those patients. But I do know that the passion among several of the pediatric nephrologists, and I love their lectures because they have a whole different take than I take, is very passionate about using uh, nephrocheck in pediatric patients. And then also just for full disclosure, um, as we saw earlier, and as Dr. Guzzi has alluded to, the nephrocheck test is not FDA cleared for pediatrics. Under 21. Right, but the question of course was, was broader in scope than, than just what was presented here. Um, and I think this last question, I can certainly address it. The, the question is, what is the cost of the test? Um, so generally speaking, you know, it's low capital expenditure for the instrument. It's less than $5,000. Um, average cell price for the, the test itself is about $100. Um, so it's, it's nominal relative to the cost of, of managing AKI as, 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 as was presented. Um, so I like, to, I like to think of it this way. And I mean, it, that's a great question. So we, uh, I did... A year ago, maybe less than a year ago, right in the middle of COVID, I was doing my 23rd hour shift and uh, I was actually sitting there with five patients on CRT and we were really stressed for machines. We didn't actually have enough machines to go around. And I was actually adding up the cost of the entire process. And you know, I know the Davida people and I know my nephrologists, three of the Davida nurses are my old ICU nurses. And I just sat there calculating the cost of dialysis. It was about $4,800 a day. Wes, I believe you said $100 for the test. Yeah. So that's 48 tests. If you can save one patient from going into AKI or needing that replacement, you can do the math. I don't need to do it for you. And that's exactly the statement I heard from my CFO because it's very expensive. And I never thought, and I, and I think this is the second most important, I never thought in a million years as we went through COVID, that we would run out of dialysis machines. I didn't think that was possible. And techs to manage them, or nurses to manage them. Um, and we certainly ran into that. We were actually picking and choosing who was going to get dialysis. So maybe it's really something we think about long-term for the management of our patients. Okay. Well, I think we're, we're at the end of our allotted time. Um, and I don't see any more questions. Um, so on behalf of uh, the Society of Critical Care Medicine and Be A Mary U, I wanna thank all of you who elected to join us for our discussion this afternoon on AKI and sepsis. Um, more specifically, I wish to thank Dr. Guzzi for his insights and, and for an excellent presentation. Uh, so I wish everyone- Thank all you guys. The Society of Critical Care Medicine is a great organization. I belong to it. I think this is my 30th year belonging to it. I've watched it mature and I just love the engagement that we have nurses, we have techs, we have RTs, we have pharmacists, we have physicians, we have uh, surgeons in there, we have everybody in there, which makes it a very unique organization, so different than so many other organizations and just uh, take the heart that we are really pushing the envelope of healthcare. And again, thank you guys for giving me an hour of your time and uh, may you all be safe and have a, uh, have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Excellent, thanks everyone.